Films in Focus with David Sterrett is underwritten by The Movie House, your destination for first-run Hollywood and independent movies, and a digital portal to the Met Opera, National Theater Live, and special events worldwide in Millerton, New York, and on the web, themoviehouse.net. David Sterrett is the editor-in-chief of the Quarterly Review of Film and Video, contributing writer at Cineast, film professor at the Maryland Institute College of Art, Robin Hood Radio's very own critic. He joins us weekly. The films are I Lost My Body, American Factory, and Les Miserables. Hi, David. Are you Miserable? I am not Miserable, and I love the way that you pronounced that so correctly, as I knew you would. Uh, but yeah, no, I am not Miserable. How about you? No, <coughs> part of two. So. Uh- Ah, well, that is good. C'est bon. Well, uh, so yeah, three films this week. And actually, the sort of uh, the semi-theme of this week, I just thought it would be good to touch on uh, some of the movies that are now nominated for the Academy Awards. Uh, as I often say, uh, I really don't take the Academy Awards at all seriously, partly because they don't overlap awfully well with my own best of the year year lists. Uh, but, uh, of course, good movies do get uh, end up getting Academy Award nominations. And in any case, curiosity about movies increases when they do get such nominations. And so I thought I'd talk about uh, three of them. Uh, and uh, that includes a couple which have been around for a while, but which I think will now get some more, uh, some renewed attention um, yeah, because they are now Oscar nominated. So let us begin with I Lost My Body, which is one of the films which is nominated for Best Animated Feature. And uh, it is, in fact, an animated film, as one might perhaps expect. I mean, such a film could be done live action and has been done. Basically, the main character of I Lost My Body is a disembodied hand or a severed hand, a hand which is on its own and which is wandering around Paris uh, all by itself and getting into various scrapes. And in fact, this is an idea that goes back for a very, very long time. And it was done in the movies decades and decades ago, long before uh, the advent of computer generated imagery. Uh, There was a movie, for example, called The Beast with Five Fingers. Uh, Many years ago, there was a movie called The Hand. You know, the idea of the severed hand thing has been done before. And, it's, and, and also in uh, the, uh, the, the, the Charles Adams family, <clears throat> the Adams family movies. That's right. Uh, thing. Exactly. We thing. had a thing bag, bank. We had a thing bank. Did you? Uh, and, uh, no, actually. The hand came out. It would take the coin and put it back in. It was fabulous. Oh, I remember those. Yeah, there was one where you sort of pulled a little handle and a hand just came out and pushed the handle back and then went back inside. So, yeah. Why not? Yes. The, the idea, which I always thought was rather amusing, about for the first five seconds. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that it's an idea that really does go back a very long way. And now we have it again. Uh, this time, however, done in animation. Uh, and it is not the focus of the entire movie. Other stuff happens along the way, too. But basically, we have a hand that manages to get out of a dissection laboratory in Paris. Uh, and it goes about looking for its body, which doesn't make any sense. But, hey, uh, this is fantasy. Uh, and uh, has, again, all kinds of adventures, some of which involve um, um, uh, predators uh, that, that are predators when you're a disembodied hand or a, a bodiless hand, uh, rats and pigeons and things like that. Uh, and uh, anyway, this goes on for quite a while and various subplots enter. Uh, and really uh, quite a bit of this movie has to do with, with uh, pizza delivery uh, and with a young pizza delivery person uh, who meets a woman in the course of his deliveries uh, and goes about looking for her. Uh, so uh, we have a hand that is looking for his body and we have a pizza deliverer who is looking for a woman who can't quite be found uh, and this sort of thing. So the animation in I Lost My Body, interesting for a, for a movie with such a sort of uh, flamboyant subject matter, is fairly restrained and it, it, it's a movie that always looks good. Uh, I didn't find it exciting and in fact I saw it quite a long while ago now and it hasn't really stuck with me very well. Uh, but it's an interesting concept for the movie, an interesting premise. It's very well animated uh, and uh, uh, it has a kind of a human interest to it because it does have this sort of love story angle as long as the sort of fantasy or even horror movie angle of the hand looking for its body. Uh, and it's an enjoyable movie and an interesting movie and an animation which has a bit more heft than a lot of the purely kid-centered animations that we tend to find nowadays. Hollywood devotes almost all of its animation uh, energies toward family audiences, which often means child audiences. And in this case, we have a movie which at least aspires to a certain uh, a certain originality and a certain 
uh, kind of all ages appeal, uh, a little bit more than some of the American animation. So I think it's well worth mentioning, and it is certainly a worthy contender for the honors of being named Best Animated Film, and we'll see before too much longer whether it succeeds in garnering that award or not. Turning now to uh, one of the movies which is nominated for Best Documentary Feature, I want to talk about American Factory. And this is a movie which is very easily uh, available to everybody. It, uh, one of these movies that's available on streaming. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, the line for me, at least, between the streaming movies and the theatrical movies is a very, very thin, wavery, and permeable one. And this is a case where we have a movie nominated for Best Academy Award, even though I think by far the greater part of its audience has already come from the streaming market. So American Factory is a documentary, and it uh, takes place uh, mainly in Ohio, a little bit in China. And uh, we have uh, here, uh, we begin with a little portrait of, uh, of Ohio, and particularly of one community in Ohio where a very, very large General Motors factory just shuts down. And an uh, enormous number of people are thrown out of their jobs. And then it turns out that a Chinese company is moving in. A Chinese company that manufactures automobile glass is coming in and is uh, going to take over the plant and hire a whole lot of Americans. And this, of course, uh, brings in all kinds of optimism and excitement because there's going to be jobs again. So the factory, the Chinese factory, the Chinese company comes in, reopens the factory, gets things going again. And we then start to get very interesting <laughs> looks at the different. The movie seems to be putatively, at least, about the differences between the Chinese approach to running a factory and the American approach to running a factory. But one of the things that fascinated me the most about this movie uh, is the fact that a whole lot of the Chinese methods are very much like American methods. Uh, the contest isn't so much between Chinese methods and American methods of, of, of running a large factory enterprise, a large manufacturing enterprise. It's really more about management and the people who actually do most of the work. Uh, and uh, that stuff comes in. For example, uh, one of the themes that starts to emerge pretty early and runs through the whole movie is the thing that a lot of the workers want to unionize. And well, the Chinese uh, owners don't want the union to happen. Well, of course, a lot of American owners, uh, if the company were purely American uh, owned, would not want the union workers to unionize either. So this is really not a clash between, uh, between the Chinese and the American methods. This is really a clash between the owning class and the working class, so to speak. So that's a theme that runs through the movie. And of course, there's all kinds of talk about uh, one of the people we see a whole lot is the Chinese uh, mogul who pretty much runs the show, who pays a lot of visits to the factory and strides through it and makes decisions about very large matters and very small matters, like what kind of mural is going to go on that wall over there. Uh, and he is very often saying, well, why aren't they working harder? Why aren't they being more productive? Why aren't they getting more done? And in a way, you can see all this is sort of, uh, he, he doesn't speak much English and he's always sort of talking through an interpreter or we have uh, subtitles on the screen and we're supposed to think, I think, part of the time, well, this is the way the Chinese run things. They're so such disciplinarians. But of course, an enormous number of American owners of a plant would be walking through and saying exactly the same kind of thing. And we have, uh, you know, uh, other things emerge along the way. It's really just basically a a, a documentary about factory methods. Uh, when do you speed things up without worrying about the tiny little maybe decrease in safety? And when do you speed things up, even though it might mean a tiny little in, in, a decrease in safety and therefore perhaps a tiny little uptick in accidents and every accident could be serious. Uh, so this is the kind of thing that runs through it. And I, I, this is the sort of thing that makes the movie, I think, very interesting. The, uh, the, the flaw with American Factory, at least the way I look at the movie. By the way, I should mention it was directed by Stephen Bogner and Julia Reicher. Julia Reicher particularly being a very distinguished figure in American film. Um, one of the things that, uh, that, that dissatisfied me about the movie, maybe the main thing, is that Ultimately, it doesn't seem to have a very focused attitude toward all of this. Uh, if the movie had a, a real sort of take on this, a pretty strong point of view, uh, then we could agree with it, disagree with it, agree with these parts of it, disagree with those parts of it. And I found the movie, as it went along, seemed to become more and more sort of unsteady in the way it was looking at all of these things. That said, it's just a very interesting look at an American factory, uh, a factory that is greeted with high hopes by a lot of workers 
workers who really, really need jobs and are very delighted to get jobs, uh, but then find that there's a downside to a lot of those jobs uh, and so forth and so on. Also, you just learn some interesting things about the manufacture of automobile glass, uh, which I thought was pre were, were pretty darn uh, pretty darn fascinating at times. So uh, again, I wish the movie had a stronger point of view on its topic. I don't mean that it should be sort of maybe a Michael Moore documentary with a point of view that's all over it all the time. Uh, but I did find it to be a little bit unfocused in that regard. That said, a very interesting movie to look at. And if you're interested in manufacturing, in business, in Chinese American relations or anything related to those things, then it's definitely the movie to seek out again, very easily to find in the streaming market. Finally, I'd like to talk about Les Miserables, uh, which is one of the movies nominated for Best International Film. And I want to squeak in here a little mention of a movie called Corpus Christi, which is another of the nominees, uh, which hasn't really officially opened in the United States. It's qualified for the awards with a, a, a brief little theatrical presence, but it's not really opening until the middle of February. Uh, so I'll probably talk more about it then. Corpus Christi, a very interesting movie uh, about a young man who uh, gets out of a juvenile detention center, uh, even though he has not yet been paroled, he's allowed to take a job in another location uh, and uh, manages to sort of disappear uh, and uh, leave the sawmill where he's supposed to be working and starts masquerading as a priest, as a young priest, uh, and soon becomes <laughs> dependent upon by the local townsfolk for his priestly services, even though he's actually a juvenile delinquent. Uh, and uh, all kinds of things transpire from there. It's a movie about religion and about criminality and about intersections between those things. And it's an interesting movie. And again, it's another one of the nominees that I'm mentioning now because people will be wondering, what is this movie that's nominated for Best International Movie of the Year? Uh, and that's it. It's opening next month. And again, we may talk more about it then. But I think it's a pretty good movie. I think uh, the movie I want to talk about right now, Les Miserables, is also a pretty good movie. Uh, it is a French movie, uh, it, although it was directed by someone with a very un-French name, uh, La Delis. Uh, uh, and it's uh, it's it's just a really 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 uh, quite fascinating film. And the title Les Misérables comes from the fact that it takes place in a banlieue, one of the suburbs of Paris, and it's a very down and dirty place. But it happens to be where, way back in the 19th century, Victor Hugo actually wrote the great novel Les Misérables. So that's one reason why the movie is called Les Misérables, sort of a tribute to uh, Victor Hugo, who wrote his novel in that exact neighborhood. But it's very much about the miserable people, the very unhappy uh, and uh, crime-infested people uh, who live in that neighborhood now. So uh, we have the story of a young man who is actually from the provinces, uh, but who has going through a personal upheaval in his life and, and he ends up taking a job uh, in Paris. And he's a policeman, a uh, police officer. And uh, he uh, gets uh, assigned to work with some veterans of the force who have been there for a long time and they're going to teach him all the ropes. He soon discovers that some of these veterans, at least especially one of them, are kind of corrupt themselves and are kind of in league with some of the criminals they're supposed to be fighting. But they insist, hey, this is the only way you can make any progress against crime in this area is by kind of getting in league with these people yourself and maybe doing some deals with them on the side. And then at least you can make things a little bit better. But this young person who is a little bit of an idealist says, but this isn't right. So that's one thing that it's about. It's about the conflict between the police and the cops and I assume the police and the uh, and the crooks and 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 the, the also the sort of of sub rosa in leagueness uh, between between the uh, the cops and the crooks. But it's also very much just about life in this banlieue, in this suburb, in this really pretty impoverished area uh, where crime is really a way of life. And interestingly, the main sort of uh, plot of the movie, one of the, it has sort of intersecting plots, it has to do with, it turns out that somebody has stolen a lion cub from a local circus. And one of the big cases that the cops are on, this little team of cops, uh, is finding this lion cub. And along the way, they get involved with drug dealers and all kinds of other miscreants. Uh, and that's what it's about. So it's a movie which is about the police and it's about policing and it's about crime and it's about criminality, but it's also very much about the social conditions that arise from all the criminality in the area and that cause all the criminality in the area. So it's really a movie with a very strong social conscience, even though it operates as a sort of a police cops and crooks melodrama. Uh, it has a very 
very interesting ending, which fascinates some people, such as me, because it's kind of open-ended and doesn't come down in a very resounding way and allows us to keep thinking about the story. And other people find that very frustrating and say, why doesn't this give us a nice, neatly tied up Hollywood style ending? For some people, the ending is a downer. For me, it's one of the most interesting things about the entire movie. It's a beautifully acted movie. It's an extremely well-directed movie. And I think it is a very worthy nominee for Best International Movie of the Year. So uh, Les Miserables is well worth seeking out. Uh, it's in theaters now. Uh, it's around. And uh, I really strongly do recommend it. If you want a good, tough, hard-boiled French police melodrama, Les Miserables is the one for you. And that is my somewhat Oscar-oriented story this week, Jill. For which we thank you as ever, David Sterrett, Films and Focus, the films I Lost My Body, American Factory, and Les Miserables. 